Welcome back. I'm happy you've clicked because, man, this one's actually going to impact all of us because it's on Steam and we all use Steam. Here's the deal. Steam have just given the okay to almost every kind of AI generated content on it. And that really matters for the industry because Steam is by far the leader. And of course, it's the usual Valve hands-off approach, right? So they revealed basically under what terms they're going to be accepting generated AI content onto Steam. There are a few limitations and rules. The thing is though, right? Can those rules even be followed by developers? Because generative AI is actually in a really complex legal spot right now. And then the question is, how does that actually change things for you? So today, I'm gonna go through the policy with you. We're gonna work out how is it gonna work, how won't it work, and what will this mean for creativity and ambition in the games that we are playing? And this is something I cannot do without first checking in with today's sponsor. It's Notion, so be it personal notes, working with the team, project management, maybe an internal wiki, Whatever it is, Notion is basically the one tool that can do it all for you. And now they've got a hell of a new feature. Now, I don't know about you, but I often find it quite hard to ingest thousands and thousands and thousands of words at once to maybe grab a little bit of info that I need out of a knowledge base. Well, to solve that problem, Notion have launched Q&A, which provides you with instant answers to your questions using information from across your workspace, essentially a personal assistant. Okay, so I tested it on our work Notion, asking, summarize what we know about World of Warcraft Midnight. And here's the response that it gave me, right? And what's neat here is, this is built from various different video scripts and documents that our team has compiled together. So essentially, you know all those like little questions you might have at work or whatever, where you can't really find the answer, but equally, you'd rather not sift through loads of stuff yourself, and you'd also rather not DM a colleague and break them out of flow. Well, Notion Q&A is perfect for that. If you've got, say, 40 pages of meeting notes, but you want to quickly get an answer and you know it's from in and around those notes, Notion Q&A can do that right now. And really, Notion Q&A is an AI implementation that actually, to me, feels synergistic. It's doing what computers do best with taking in loads of info, and it means that I get more time to do what I do best, which is fantastic. Now, it gives you links, of course, to all the relevant pages. It all works with your permission, so your data is safe. Users in your Notion won't be able to access anything they're not supposed to be able to, as an example. And if you're already a Notion AI user, you can actually just get started today with with Q&A already in your Notion workspace. And if you're interested in trying it out, you can join the waitlist to get early access if you use my link down below. Right, let's crack open this can of worms. A little bit of context here. 2024 has already seen Steam's highest concurrent user stat ever. Kind of crazy. 33.6 million people logged in and 10.6 million people actually playing something concurrently. That is absolutely mad, and this came shortly after the analysis was done that shows that 14 thousand games were released on Steam in 2023. And I suppose to celebrate all of this and make today's story even more funny, um, well, it is Steam Capitalism and Economy Festival running from January 8th to 15th. So um, that's all nice and fun. Uh, I mean, hey, man, <laughs> see those like business strategy management games? I kind of love those things. Um, they're very fun. I love good shop sim. Anyway, let's actually talk about things and AI. Valve are not the first to do this though, Epic Games actually said that they were okay with generative AI stuff back last year. Now, they also said it's not the end of the conversation, and if it ends up being a you know an almighty shit show, they will revisit their policy. But for now, look, yeah, if you want to use a bunch of AI content in your game, Epic's okay with that. Let's talk about Valve then. So, Valve, as they always have been, uh, they're basically sure to make the problem and the liability belong to anybody but them, so that they can sit back be a platform, not have to deal with an inordinate amount of moderation, and of course, take their 20 to 30%, for most people, 30% cut of things. So let's talk about their rules then. First up, they've got the content survey. Now, this content survey is filled out by anybody who is looking to sell a game on Steam, and it now has an AI disclosure section, and that will determine what type of AI modeling Valve needs to be aware of. So if you are using content that is pre-generated, any kind of content, which means art, code, sound, etc., created with the help of AI tools during development, you need to promise that there's no illegal or infringing content there and that it matches your game's marketing material. 
materials. What's interesting there is uh, actually to me, code. I mean, the art thing seems pretty cut and dry. I have hilarious examples for you later, but look, code. That's an interesting thing. See, a lot of the time, you can even just take, uh, you know, take a, a bit of code that you've written. You can just slap that into chat GPT and say, you know, hey, could you optimize this? Or, you know, could you point out flaws in my code? And it actually will do a, a good job there. And loads of programmers actually are finding that chat GPT is very useful for them as a learning tool. So they can try something and maybe they want to make it better. They can't figure out how, well, chat gpt can actually do a really good job of suggesting alternatives and writing functional code you know it'll actually work and then as the programmer of course the bit that matters is that you look at the code it's generated look at yours apply its suggestions you know with intelligence and actually learn from the process but even something like that technically you would have to disclose that itself is interesting because i mean how many video games have just code that is wholesale copied from the unity forums or from stack overflow kind of interesting now if you're using content that is quote live generated any kind of content generated with the help of ai tools while the game is running then the above will be in effect plus the developer will need to explain how their tools will not generate anything illegal or infringing so as an example here let's just say you're embedding a language model inside your video game and your npcs in the game will be able to have you know sort of more reactive conversations with the player because there's ai generation you'll need to somehow prove <laughs> that whatever model you're using will not uh, generate infringing content good luck doing that uh, valve then will review the game in line with their regular policies and uh, they will include the disclosure given by the dev on the store page so that consumers can then make their own choice the second part to this then they're releasing a system on steam that's going to give players a report function for illegal content in live generated games the only blanket ban though is that otherwise live generated ai will not be allowed for games that feature adult only content i mean come on you all have brains i think you know how that could go right pretty spicy so to be 100 percent clear then this policy is developers need to be a hundred percent certain uh, of their content and then uh, you know they need to be honest about that whenever they are paying to submit their game or else it can be rejected or pulled down the onus will be on players to flag illegal content in a game that features it uh, presumably there'll also be some sort of filter so people can avoid these a bit like how you can turn off adult uh, games in uh, you know in steam now the thing is these safeguards are basically going to be useless and i think anybody who is uh, you know even using something like github copilot they're not going to click that because there's functionally no way valve can tell right um i i just think that like this is literally not going to work although it is going to lead to very interesting things. So identifying previously AI generated work, that is something predicated on the original creator uh, disclosing that. And this actually brings us to an update in a recent story that we covered regarding the people over at Wacom. Okay, so Wacom, they are a, uh, an artist sort of pen tablet company, right? And what happened there, right, is they used an image from a library of 3,000 images on Adobe stock. That image happened to be AI generated. The people in the marketing department who used that, they just grabbed a stock image from a website, then goes up, they get absolutely roasted on social media. Did Wacom intend to use AI gen content? Nope. Somebody in the marketing department who therefore I think perhaps doesn't have just, you know, the artist's eye to sort of sleuth out this kind of thing. They thought they used artwork from adobe stock that they had a license to and then in that video we talked about what zalavir was uh, saying about the game that they were going to make that would be using stock images as like a form of absurdist comedy but because of things like this they actually cannot guarantee that in using the stock image library that they won't have a game full of ai generated content that copyright wise exists under very shaky ground so this is a real life working example of this stuff going awry almost immediately. Uh, so yeah, you know, look, people lie sometimes, especially when they can just cut their costs and think that nobody else will notice. That's the kind of thing that happened there. So it's going to be up to Valve then to confirm whether a game has AI content or not. And how are they going to do that? I mean, sometimes games end up for sale that don't actually have a functioning EXE. So if that's the sort of thing that can slip by process, uh, you know, how, how are Valve going to be able to determine if every piece of content in a game, even including code, th that won't be generating illegal or infringing content? This seems 
completely unworkable. It seems unworkable, but something they can point to. Valve then have given the responsibility for identifying the copyright and legal stuff and that they have missed or appears in live generations to users en masse, who of course, uh, you know, often will then use Steam's tools for their own agendas. Now, I know a lot of people, maybe a game will get uh, boycotted, maybe because of some political thing. And, uh, you know, to some people, they'll leave the joke reviews or, you know, they might say based or whatever, but let's just fundamentally here. These things can be weaponized in a way that doesn't reflect their original purpose. That equals disinformation, confusion, people being misled, etc., etc., etc. And uh, I mean, if, if you think it's okay when your side uses it, but not okay when the other side uses it, well, that doesn't really work, right? Uh, you know, there's like the base principle here. The base principle is this is obviously going to be misused. A really funny thing, actually. Um, false positives, then. So did you know that the, <laughs> that the United States Constitution is in fact written by an AI? Yeah, lazy slackers. Obviously, it wasn't written by an AI, but a whole bunch of AI detectors look at the US Constitution and think that it's written by an AI. So if that sort of thing is going on, how the hell are false positives going to be dealt with? Because Valve barely moderates Steam on a good day. So basically, Valve have an unworkable policy that they can point to as a shield, and a lot of the actual grunt work is just going to be left to their community. And if you're going to be sort of very cold and business oriented, yeah, that's really smart. <laughs> in a way, right? Like if they think they can get away with that and that this is the only shield that they need, obviously this means they don't have to have, you know, an, a whole department dealing with this sort of problem. Uh, then many people would think, well, come on, you're taking 30%. That's a pretty high cut. Surely you can afford to, you know, sort of run things decently. Anyway, the other side of this is that, well, with the LLMs, look, this is not a subtle technology, right? Um, actually, every major LLM, from what we can tell, it's being sued for copyright infringement in some way. I mean, actually, here's an example of uh, some stuff from Midjourney. So Paul Tassi, um, he, you know, you might think that this is a screenshot from The Last of Us. It's not. So Paul put in the prompt, a video game character who's a young girl traveling with a middle-aged man in the apocalypse. Now, is he saying what that girl looks like, what that man looks like? Nope, he ain't. Now, I'm going to take you to, is Paul clickbait fake news? Now, I wanted to check, like, if this was some sort of clickbaity situation, if you were getting the full story from what Paul said. So, here's what I did. I went to mid-journey, right? And I got Paul's prompt. I put Paul's prompt in. Here we can see... It's 78% through the generation. And just like uh, the good Baron raising up from his happy slop, here we have the result. This is a straight, uh, you know, this is exactly what Mid Journey gave me. And this is what it gave me on my very first run of that prompt. Now we can see we have slightly different alleys, but, you know, especially like the bottom two, they're, they're looking a little bit more on model. Uh, three of the Joels look like Joel. Top right Joel doesn't really look like Joel, but pretty clearly, you can see that for, you know, what it associates here, is it making a unique man, a unique girl, a unique apocalypse? No, it's, uh, you know, whatever way that's, you know, beep, beep, boop, inside its neural net. I mean, this is what's obviously present in the training data. Like, you know, think about the weightings, how these neural nets work. Bam, there you go. Now, I wanted to test something else. So we decided to do video game character who is bearded scientist, uh, you know, wearing a protective suit, wielding a crowbar, brown hair, beard, glasses. And here's what we got. Uh, certainly, these don't really look like Gordon Freeman. I mean, you can, you know, almost squint your eyes, kind of blur your vision, and you can see a bit of Gordon Freeman in there, but not really. So I decided, right, if this is what that looks like, um, this is a great conversation that we had internally. And, and Connor was like, okay, just do Gordon Freeman. And then I put in just Gordon Freeman. And does this look way more like Gordon Freeman? Yes. And the prompt here is just Gordon Freeman. But you can see almost the similarities here from the generic version to the Gordon Freeman. Now, you could definitely say, like, we're looking for similarities here. But, you know, it's like, why, uh, you know, why, why the orange suit in these? Where does that come from? You know, how, how does it actually dream this up? Because that's one of the things. These models actually work in quite a black box fashion. You know, like you train them, you, uh, you know, you do a little bit of, uh, you know, you do, you do the training, but it's actually quite black box, the thinking that goes on inside the neural net. So then I thought seven foot tall soldier from the future wearing green power armor, wielding a rifle, standing in a heroic pose. And this guy, I don't know whether we should call him uh, Master Slayer or uh, the Doom Chief, but you can really see like 
this is this is Master Chief mixed in with the Doom Slayer. And on the bottom right, I mean, this kind of looks like the, uh, you know, this looks like the JRPG version of Master Chief and Doom Slayer. So it's just interesting, I suppose. This can maybe tweak us on to just a little bit of how these models work. Now, let's get back to the story, talk about the legalities of this. Over at OpenAI, they're arguing in a court case that making any kind of chatbot or image-based large language model that's useful would be impossible without breaching copyright. That makes it okay, I guess weird argument. Because copyright today covers virtually every sort of human expression, including blog posts, photographs, forum posts, uh, scraps of software code and government documents, it would be impossible to train today's leading AI models without using copyrighted material, said OpenAI in its submission first reported by The Telegraph. So, point there, um, it's very interesting. So, uh, in a way, Mickey Mouse, like Steamboat Willie Mickey Mouse, that stuff is like kind of entered public domain now, even though like they're trying to make... Uh, sort of the Mickey Mouse character be a trademark of Disney and protect it that way. There's a really good legal eagle video on that. But this is sort of the example. If you were to take, say, Edgar Allan Poe, um, a lot of the, a lot of his work was recently adapted into the fall of House of Usher, which, uh, you know, Mike Flanagan's show, I really enjoyed it. You could, if, if you just got basically works by dead people in the public domain, you could train your LLM based on that. I would love to hear how it speaks. And that would probably be totally fine from that copyright perspective because that's trained off public domain works. But the, the way that it works with um, with copyright, I believe, is that you don't like need to register that. It just, it, it's automatically yours when you've made something, unlike a trademark, which you need to register. So um, yeah, they're basically just saying, oh, can't do this without infringing everyone's copyright. It's fine. And we'll certainly have to see how that happens within court systems. So on that basis, then, you can't use any significantly publicly available LLM for game development unless you can guarantee that they own the copyright for every image used in the model and the final result per the Steam rules. So that means either you need to make your model from images or text that you've created yourself, which, uh, look, if you're doing that, there's sort of two things going on. There's way more than two, but I'm, this is what I'm going to say, right? You've got the very computationally expensive LLMs with gargantuan data sets where, you know, the, the, those babies are eating up 4090s and uh, big expensive NVIDIA chips for breakfast. But then you have some people who are trying to innovate in another way, making more lightweight and portable models that can run on device. And generally they're not as good, but um, maybe the innovations in that space could allow an artist to say, okay, little small model, I want you to train off this body of my work. Go! And then your AI is only using your work. Then what is that? That's a tool for an artist based on things they've done that they own or that a company owns. But basically nobody can really say that right now. There is another side to that, and that is working with stock images being remixed. So there's a recent example here, Getty Images and NVIDIA. Um, this is called Generative AI by iStock powered by NVIDIA Picasso. And that is basically that stock image library where you would think, great, all the licensing, etc., is fantastic. But as we just covered with Wacom and stuff that was taken from an Adobe stock library, the stuff in the stock image library itself could be AI generated. Oh man, yeah, so this is, uh, this is, whew, this is interesting. But basically, see this as a tool for developers to do better work? Awesome. This as a, uh, you know, sh shitty grift situation? Very, very, very bad. Very bad indeed. Now, this is something we then connect to another story, and this is from NVIDIA, and it's their NPC AI technology. They showed off the latest iteration of it at uh, the Consumer Electronics Show. So, you know, here you go. You can you can sort of see this generation. And I will be honest, when you look at it, it you know, in some ways it is like a visually impressive technical showcase. Basically, what's happened with this is it's went from being able to respond to verbal prompts from the player to now having NPCs in the scene moving around and interacting with pre-selected props uh, sort of in the scene as is appropriate, right? So um, this is very much the way that like, okay, your NPC, it is now able to do more sort of thinky things. And I suppose think about it this way. A lot of the technology that would be used for image recognition in a robot, I mean, just thinking about, say, Tesla Optimus or any of those other robotics projects, where that robot has got to dynamically 
interact with things based on its view of what it can see with its sensors, such as, you know, its its cameras or any of that. You know, you can see that sort of thing being ran in the real world to help a robot go about and deal with unexpected situations. You can also see that being used basically for an NPC in a video game. And obviously, like, the technology here on stage is really impressive. And I think we can see, like, imagine a Bethesda game that had NPCs that could do this. Sounds amazing in a pitch. Todd will still say, it just works. And then we will have decades of hilarious memes. Um, anyway, what, what, what's going on here? What, what's, what's the situation? What's the point of this? How is this better than before, right? Okay, let's talk about that. NVIDIA are reporting that developers like NetEase, Tencent, Ubisoft, and uh, MiHoYo are working with this technology with them. Uh, and of course, they're trying to improve the player experience. And the point here is if you're wandering around in a game like Far Cry, Assassin's Creed, if you're, uh, you know, talking to Paimon and Genshin, that was better. The obvious one is verisimilitude, right? So... Basically, I mean, th think about what an NPC that can sort of act like that would be able to do versus a standard, let's just say, a standard, uh, you know, Bethesda NPC or even a Larian NPC, where, of course, a Larian NPC, I mean, man, the, um, the sheer amount of work that they have done, ungodly, unbelievable, insane amazing but you know what would an ai do well to go for our earlier example of talking to paimon and genshin impact uh well if you start following up uh you know talking about breakfast and then you follow up by asking to see her kitchen can she just go okay i can do that in a way that's like not a pre-programmed interaction can that happen in a dynamic way uh, that basically makes that NPC feel like, uh, well, like a character rather than a sort of pre-programmed actor puppet thing. Uh, now, you can see that being good, but then what happens if it loses coherence and starts hallucinating and it, you know, Paimon is now just trailing off into nonsense because, um, you know, the, the LLM shat itself. Well, there's probably going to be a layer of, you know, checks and balances, curation, and that kind of thing. And this leads us to the final, something I've also talked about recently in AI voice acting. It blends the use of pre-recorded lines and generated ones built on them to have the commentators be able to react to the match and the team makeup. The principle is that these commentators can be adapted and changed at will by the developers. And, uh, of course, what actually happens, though, is that they, they sound boring. They're more specified to the action in the game but they sound boring. Imagine, I mean, I was always impressed when I was younger, the the commentary in a FIFA game. You know, you're playing a FIFA, the, the EA football game. Uh, I haven't played one of those in like a decade or two, but it, not two. Um, but imagine if suddenly those commentators are way more reacting to you. Of course, amazing in theory. You can see why a tech team would totally investigate that. Or if you just lose the essence you know, and it just feels cold and dead. So between Steam, what NVIDIA are doing, and what's going on with the finals, what does this actually mean for us as audiences, as people who want to just buy some video games, enjoy them, and have fun? Well, personally, I would say you're never going to get an Alan Wake from this. You're not. And, you know, you're never going to get a Last of Us Part 1 from this. It's just, you know, it's just not going to happen. Now, maybe in 10 years, it could happen. And we definitely have to have a conversation when it's like that. But as for right now, no, it's just it's not good enough. It's not good enough. It won't be a good, uh, it won't be a good experience, and it will be defeated, uh, you know, by those who do the real work. Now, I'd certainly wonder, you know, modders, modders actually want to do a narrative mod but can't afford voice actors or something. Will, will they try to use this? I wonder. Um, I mean, from a production standpoint, the response is always that the generative AI content will somehow make games, you know, cheaper to produce, and that means that some sorts of games will be financially viable where they otherwise wouldn't be. And I suppose, hey, if all you care about is engagement, and now you can have endless conversations just with with NPCs, oh boy, your engagement numbers just went up. But pff, you know that that people will people will soon develop a keen eye for that, and they will know to avoid it. So ultimately, I think that there are likely a small number of creatives who could use this in a way that is genuinely interesting. You know, that's providing maybe some commentary on the issue by using it. Sure. I think there are good enough creatives to do that. However, big picture, I think this will be used as a cost-saving measure. And honestly, because of Steam's decision, now this is something that can easily happen on the biggest platform in gaming, right? It can happen where all the PC games are. And because of that, <laughs> whether, you know, is this good? Is this bad? I mean, I'm pretty sure I know what's going to happen, but guess what? We're going to find out because it'll be on Steam. What do you think is going to happen? Let me know down below. That's it for today's video. Of course, I will see you over in this one. Check it out next. Thank you for watching. I'll see you next time.